Ron Jeremy fled in more ways than we could ever consider, including through time. One year before mankind plunged into the Second World War, renowned archaeologist Dr. Jones discovered evidence of Ron Jeremy's great temporal leap. Ron Jeremy's ultimate goal? Ensure the Soviet Union would accelerate their lust for power and spread communism across the globe. Task Force 69 members were immediately dispatched through time to stop. Where is Ron? They screamed. Gone, he said with a chuckle. The 1980s. And with a final gasp, the dying man gave up the ghost. The hunt continues. If you've ever put french fries on your hamburger, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, like and comment. The comment section is out of control. If you guys are looking to support the channel, the biggest support of the channel right now is Big Daddy Unlimited. Big Daddy Unlimited is like the Costco of the gun world. 99 cents for the first month after that price goes up. Is it worth it? Are you worth it? <laughs> if you guys are looking to support the channel in other ways, we have a couple other great sponsors. We have D-Bag, definitely recommended. It's just basically like a gift box. You know, you guys have used them before, but they support the channel. Go check them out. They have great stuff. It's a great little weird gift for somebody that you don't know uh, what to get for them for Christmas or something like that. We, of course, have Safe Life Defense with their body armor and finally Mirror Defense with their gas mask. Go check them out. Ladies, gentlemen, my often forgotten, but most certainly not by me. Colt Monitors, welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about a very cool submachine gun, and that is going to be the 1928A1. So I'll go ahead and have my buddy Sean come on. Sean, come on in here. You've been on the channel a couple of times at this couple point, now. man. Yep. Um, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody again? Uh, yeah, uh, Sean, uh, again, served 10 years in the Army, currently still active, uh, all infantry. Gross, um, just kidding, man. Just, <laughs> that's pretty that's cool. About it. You, you had yeah. a cool career, man. It's been all right, so uh, also, that's about it. Also, great Indiana Jones cosplayer as well. Yeah. That that's, matters. That's what matters to me. <laughs> so, dude, um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, 1928 A1. Uh, I know you have a lot of time researching this. Um, yes. You love this submachine gun. So I thought we'd just take a second to talk a little bit about it and some of the kind of the, a little bit of the history behind it, because I think it's a, it's a very interesting kind of piece yes. in the history of submachine guns. And now, to be clear, before we get into it, a lot of people mistake the Thompson submachine gun is the first submachine gun ever made. It was not the first submachine gun ever made, but in many ways it paved the way for design influences and general looks for many submachine guns to come. Um, so, I mean, before we get into it, you want to talk a little bit about the history of it, man? Yeah, so basically... You gotta hold it. I'm going to. <laughs> so basically the thought process on the design of this was actually derivative of uh, trench warfare. So, you know, they wanted this trench broom, this sweeping weapon that uh, the troops could drop down in, take control of the trench, and sweep literally through the trench with these guns. So, I mean, fun, you know, little things. Like, it was originally designed to not have a buttstock, so it was tucked in and used as more of like a broom-style uh, weapon system. So, uh, given that, uh, it went into a period of time where we weren't in war anymore, right? World War I ended. Uh, there's not really a market. So now this weapon system has been created. They're trying to sell it to the military, but there's not a need for it. So then we start going into, you know, the actual cost of production. Yeah. Being one of the most expensive weapons that we 
as the United States military actually purchased at that time at two hundred and five dollars a unit uh, for you know nineteen thirty nine prices. That's yeah, pretty I think, insane. I think it was uh, two thousand three hundred dollars, like yeah, roughly which, today time. That's yeah. very specific, but so, somewhere right around there. You know, so as as they went through like anything, the army tries to find a cheaper way to do it. Classic. Uh, and you know, so these models were seen uh, and sold to Great Britain. They were sold in uh, France during the resistance. Uh, but when they got to the military, they started taking off the uh, the you know the classic Tommy gun look, adding over this. Uh, they started taking the, the fins out of the barrel, took the cuts compensator. Uh, cuts got a dollar for every compensator sold. So you know they're a lot like, of money back in the time. Yeah, so they're like take that off. These rear sights that range out to 500 for 45 were kind of useless. So they went to. I a, would love to see somebody make a 500 yard uh, 45 uh, caliber you're, you're shot. Be you're just, here. Yeah, I don't think it's time. happening. It's mortars. But yeah, so you know, then they started moving over. It's a really interesting design uh, from actually just at all that they put the charging handle on the top and then yeah. thought we'll just cut it open so you can see through it. It's really odd that it's, it, it, it took. Is the army to say, hey, put it on the side. It so, is very odd, yeah. It is, and then, of course, we can talk about the operating system, mm -hmm. being the Blishlock. Uh, for sure. And being that it is a blowback operator and all that. So Blishlock, uh, for those that don't understand, there is a brass piece inside of here that the thought process was that brass, under pressure when you fire, uh, would lock the chamber shut so that the gas could then cycle the bolt. So the thought process, this is coming from artillery, mm -hmm. this is naval gunfire uh, type stuff. So 45 didn't really need it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it didn't. It, uh, it, it went away, it phased out. So If, if I'm not mistaken, in, in modern kind of recreations, when they've actually modeled out, they realized that the Blishlock really had very little to Absolutely. do with the function of the weapon. It was really, yes. truly a superfluous uh, you know, addition to the mechanism. Yeah, and it was actually, I mean, a lot of people kind of think about it, you know, it was a patented design that mm -hmm. uh, the guy Blish got money for. Yeah. So, you know, he contacted, you know, and uh, was like, this is only going to work if you use this system, and yeah. there's no really argument there, so they no, used it. <laughs> there's not much you can do but, about it. Yeah, so, I mean, there's, we can talk for hours and hours about, you know, some of the little things, but yeah. I think the most interesting thing, honestly, is that Blish Lock, the mm -hmm. idea that, uh, you needed four different moving parts to make just a blowback weapon work. Oh, for sure. So. I, I agree. I think I think it's really interesting. And again, one of the reasons we have Sean is for our grunt perspective, oh. which is going to be our <laughs> little segment right here. But uh, if you want to come in here, we'll kind of take a closer look at this weapon right here. We're going to start as we always do, just like the Navy likes, tip to butt. Oh, so, yeah, man. I know. Classic. But if you want to come in here and take a really close look at the Cuts Compensator, uh, it is a very interesting design. It is very well made. This is something that I've always loved about older weapons is just the amount of, like, style that goes into yeah, them. Yeah, the finishing work. It, it's, I know. You it's don't see it. It's incredible. It looks, it's just a very evocative design, in my opinion. I just love the way they look. So a very cool design and actually pretty effective. So the cool thing about doing some of our videos on the range is that we can just go ahead and show you some of that stuff. So I'm going to grab my iPro right yeah. here, which are covered in rain. And uh, we'll take a couple shots with this just to show you guys how well that system works. So as you can see, this weapon climbs very, very little um, for the rate of fire and everything else. And that comes down to a couple things. The cuts compensator for sure. Yeah but also the weight. Yeah, absolutely. This thing is absolutely ridiculously heavy for for how small, you know, you think about it's about the same size as a 10 inch M4. Yeah. Uh, it is about four times as heavy. Uh, it's, it is so it's heavy. It's insane. Yeah. So yeah, the recoil. Um, I can't imagine it's, carrying this around as, as a guy. And in fact, I have one of the um, pouches that they would have worn to carry the 30 round stick yeah. mags. It's supposed to carry five in there. With the five, it's it's crazy it's swinging insane. around. It's a lot well, of weight. A lot of the World War Two and I mean even earlier World War One. A lot of it was like, how do we carry more? Yeah. And then comfortability and actually you know usability later was like maybe that stuff didn't work. Maybe that wasn't such a so good idea. So it's it's very you know yeah just stick five of those in a pouch it'll be sick. It, you know it's super right. hard. It's super so. super difficult to carry. But uh, another cool thing about this, if you want to come here and yeah. take a look, is look at the look at the the heat fins right there. Just look at the amount of machining that went into it. Just a very, very beautiful design. 
So again, if you're not familiar with what these are made for, it's uh, barrels heat up, they get very hot. Uh, these add surface area so that the barrels can cool off faster. Therefore, you don't get uh, problems that happen as barrels heat up, uh, you know, barrel wear and drift of zero as the barrel droops and that type of thing. So yeah. the, those heat fins really help with that. And to be clear, there are multiple different types of hand guards that we can have on our Thompsons. This is more of an M1A1 type style Yeah, right this here. was, so this is an interesting model just because uh, being that this is a 1928 uh, A1, uh, it's, it's in the middle of yep. transferring from a civilian made because there wasn't a military market yet. Uh, they figured, you know, we need a sling point. So they added these instead of having a pistol grip mm -hmm. style, uh, added a sling mount back here. And then as it kind of evolved, you know, these things that we're talking about that we like so much, yep. you know, like even down to this, you know, Thompson engraved in the cuts compensator so cool. <laughs> and it, it just all kind of went away because yep. you got to think mass production, World War II, mm -hmm. they're, they're stamping these out of factories across America. Uh, the fins were lost, you yeah. know, they were like, well, screw that cuts compensator, that's a dollar. Yeah. Uh, these sites, you know, hey, we'll just give a folded piece of metal and uh, put a hole in it and call it a day. So, <laughs> that's all you, you know, need, yeah. that's that's really where this gun went is how do we make it cheaper so these older ones uh the earlier models are just you know beautiful it's yeah it is beautiful. just something different now if we come over to here um you can see the magazine mechanism so you know when you think of magazines today you, you think about how easy it is to load a magazine yeah. with the thompson it, it's very interesting as you can see here on the magazine we have these little ribs right here and they insert directly onto there so it kind of rides along those rails right there to then lock into place so magazine changes aren't great and what's funny is these are later war magazines right here they're 30 rounders originally we had 20 rounders and even before the 20 rounders we had these giant drums now these drums are very interesting for a variety of reasons so they hold 50 rounds and they are difficult to load difficult to maintain and extremely difficult to actually insert into the magazine yeah, while it Sean so <laughs> yeah well, as we found out it turns into a two-person kind of job where if, if you're really not knowing what you're doing you're kind of like hey buddy like yeah, oh, yeah, load gotcha. me up so uh, what's interesting and before I load this up and look retarded doing it yeah, uh, no problem so you these can't use that word anymore, I'm sorry I'm just kidding oh Jesus <laughs> <laughs> they use it on me all the time Do they? <laughs> so uh, what's interesting about the magazine mechanism here is that it was designed for two different ones so you have this locking mechanism for the hole in the back of the magazine right here but then the drum does not use that at all it uses uh, this slot back here on this arm so it's not a button it's actually a that lever to him a little bit more yeah so you can see it so it's a lever instead of a button that everything on almost every weapon system we're used to yeah. uh, is now so you know going in it's lining up the t-slot and going in course that one worked. Dude, that one worked, Perfect. right? <laughs> I was really surprised. So, yeah, but going in like that, but then again, the kind of removing it, we're used to doing things with the firing hand, trying to get this button, and you just really can't. It's kind of like a come in here and then rotate it and pull it out. It, it's just, it's not... It's not. It's, it's not, not a speed reload type of system here. But the, but the biggest problem with these magazines... They're loud and they're heavy constant noise so that was a big complaint with these magazines when they were used in combat situations was how much noise they made when these guys were running with these imagine three of these in a pouch imagine one of these on your gun and as you're moving imagine trying to sneak up on somebody and this is just moving around every time you move even the slightest compare that to like the 20 rounders a little bit of juggle 30 rounders almost none so it's for that reason as well that they went away from the drums and eventually the M1A1 couldn't even accept a drum magazine yeah, they, it was just termed not useful at all yeah for and that was use. again uh that was the army you know cutting their corners and figuring out how do we mill out this piece of metal and make less cuts and oh. that's a cut that doesn't need to be made anymore so it just doesn't accept them oh absolutely you know we have to get to my favorite part right here because I'm gonna have to go set trigger right now. <laughs> so we're gonna feel this trigger. So as you can tell, it is an open bolt design. That means when I pull the trigger, it releases a sear, bolt slams forward, fires, cycles, all that kind of stuff. So that is how the Thompson works. It is not a closed bolt design. So let's go ahead and put on a little Unchained Melody. Let's try that together. So feeling into it, very little play getting into it. About a nine pound trigger getting back into it. Let's try that one more time. About nine pound. Let's go ahead and cycle that. See the reset. There is no reset because it's full <laughs> auto. 
<laughs> so it's always a good time with the Thompson. The trigger isn't terrible. It does have no, very little. Not. It does have very little play. It is a nine pound trigger. That's very common for military type weapons. Yeah. So overall, as far as military triggers go, it's very nice. Now here's what's. Oh, go ahead, actually, man. You know, I was gonna say it actually feels almost the same as a 240. It does. It really yeah, does. You're right. Every part of it, when you when you're pulling that bolt back, and this this whole sear system, if you take it apart, mm -hmm. it is almost identical. Like That's things really cool. have not changed, and uh, you can really feel it when you're firing it. You get that nice, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you do. Chunk. You get that. You get that very nice, like positive. You're shooting this gun. And that is the thing so. about shooting long range. We have a couple videos right here of me shooting long range with it, but when you're shooting past 50 meters, um, when you pull that trigger, that bolt rides it, forward, and yep. so you always have a tendency to kind of dip down with it so that is a problem with firing long range it's definitely doable you just kind of have to really focus on yourself and think about yourself and believe in yourself but if you want to come in right here and take a look let's take a look at the controls they're very interesting very different from what we're used to with from modern weapons so as you can see right here we have our fire and our safe so fire with the lever forward and then of course whoops let's go ahead and lock that back and then of course safe when we have it locked back so we have those two and then we have full auto and single and that is separate from fire and safe which is very interesting in my opinion it's not very easy to rotate these um, it's kind of counterintuitive in my opinion it, it is they're backwards from what we're used to now precisely so it, it was an interesting design and again you have to remember they didn't really have anything to go off of this is one of the very this early automatic weapons it's like oh how do we make this automatic this is what they came up with obviously this didn't end up kind of sticking but it's still a very interesting kind of piece of history in the design. Um, and when we come to the grip, uh, I do like the grip quite a bit. It, it's kind of thick. It's it's chunky. It's chunky. She feels good. It, it, she feels good. <laughs> but it's interesting to me because, you know, with the Thompson, uh, when it was fielded, people weren't as big as they are now. No, and that is actually interesting. I thought about that as we were shooting it. Yeah. Right. Well, height-wise, you know, I'm about right for what a soldier would have been in World War II. But, I mean, I'm probably... 80 pounds heavier than the standard grunt at that time just yeah. being the fact that you know we were talking about nutrition and just overall genetics at that time that is a huge grip for that time and the length of pull is extremely long and, yeah and that kind of bring is. that kind of brings us over to the stock which we kind of talked about but that stock because we have a that stock that drops it dude it's not uh, it's not great yeah it's, it's <laughs> not it has a ten the thompson definitely has a tendency to want to climb yeah absolutely like uh it, it, it's just the way it is. If the stock was more in line, it would definitely be easier to control, but as it is being this much lower yeah. than all that cycling mass. I think that one of the other things too that's interesting is that if this stock was just, you know, an inch, two inches shorter, oh, it would sure. make it better. Because it be, I mean, yeah. again, you've got longer arms than I do, but I mean, I am struggling to get this up. <laughs> yeah. I would not shoot this like this. I would all day. Little little, little short arms. I, I would, yeah. It's it's. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. It's no, I know. too long. Oh, for sure. So. For sure. And, and of course, tactics and, and procedures were, were different back then yeah, for what absolutely. people typically did. But it is kind of an interesting piece of history. Um, the final thing we'll talk about are the sights. Um, with the sites that we have right here, these are the more expensive sites, yes. like Sean was talking about. Um, you had something interesting to say about those sites, actually, didn't you? So, uh, being, well, yeah, being that this was actually one of the most expensive parts of the gun, uh, they're supposed to range out all the way to 500 or, or further. Uh, and like we talked about, being yeah. the fact that it's 45, you're not shooting it that far. So, uh, these were scrapped really early on to this folded piece of metal uh, peep site with a notch on top for, uh, I believe it was 100 and 200. Yeah. And that's what we just left it at. Um, and the later models, they got kind of a protective, that yep. distinct, you know, we the know wings. what that looks yeah. like. Yeah, the that wings. winged uh, triangle. But I, yeah. I love the way these old ones look. You want to go they, show it to the camera a little bit There's a there. lot of uh, very machining cool. in that. It's they're very, I mean. How much are, was it for the site to I make them? I believe they were $10 a piece. That's ridiculous for but the amount again, that it costs. You know, I mean, thinking about all the mechanisms and all the, just if you're trying to mass produce these. And it's just not. It's just not there. Not for it doesn't wartime. need to be. Not so. for wartime. Well, definitely a really cool piece of technology. Um, something yeah. I, I've always loved the Thompsons and, you know, comparing it to the M1A1, which I've shot quite a bit as well, um, I would definitely consider this more controllable, both due to the cyclic rate, which is faster than the M1A1, right. and also due to the compensator. Definitely helps. Well, this and is you were very talking easy about the Blish Lock as well. Yeah, you know, it's different. It's like we want to believe it doesn't work because everything yeah. says it shouldn't. Yeah. But then, as you said, you shot one that doesn't have it, and it's a different system. It's the, a different firing gun. The 1928, um, it just has a little bit of magic juju to it, yeah. and it just feels good. I love the 1928. It's 
definitely one of my favorite weapons, and I ha I hate to say it, but what was it? Medal of Honor Pacific Assault. <laughs> As a kid, they had this yeah. gun. I fucking yeah, loved it. From that. I loved it. I love video games and guns, yep. and so um, I've always loved the look. Specifically of the uh, twenty eight A one because yeah. of the ribbed barrel it has and character. everything. It has character. It has character it's, man. Honestly, if you think about it again, it's you know you get further into the war, things it's, it's a stamp, right? Yeah. It's a stamp. It get it off the line as fast as possible. For this sure. was sold to the civilian market first. Just had a little you know, bit of it, it's. It just looked good, yeah. you know. It just definitely looked good. So what we'll do here is I'm gonna go and empty out a twenty round magazine because I gotta, and we gotta do it. <laughs> God, I love that gun. Very cool. Well, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a very, very cool little piece of history. Thank yeah, you, Sean, absolutely. for coming thank on, you. man. Yeah, of course, anytime, it. dude. Um, so, I mean, here's the thing. With any of this, um, if you can get your hands on one of these, <laughs> you, you absolutely should. But like everything, if you don't train, you're not going to be good. You can be good. You can be very good at this. You can make maybe 500-meter shots if you train. Maybe. So get out there and train, guys. Yeah. Uh, tons of great guys out there. Um, I know you work with a group that does a lot of training out here in the Pacific Northwest, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, Epsilon Northwest. Cool. Uh, we, again, it's just a group of guys that uh, we're just trying to give back, yeah. right? It's not that we're trying to give certificates out and make people, you know, I want a certificate. Certified. I want a certificate. I'll make one Thank for you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, given that, it's just we want people to come out and just shoot. Have fun, build a community, and, and have some structure behind it without sure. just going to the range and shooting for shooting for sure man that's awesome yeah. you know and if you guys are in an area where you're, you're not near here or something definitely go create one of those communities and yeah. you know get some good stuff going so get out there get training guys thank you so much for watching point of, shoot, of shooting is to look cool and this definitely makes you look cool absolutely take care gentlemen uh last thing that advice all right oh man all right I we got one more thing that. for I you yeah i know <laughs> dad advice so sean you've been on before you're a dad i am a little dad advice for my people uh, dad advice for today, uh, you're never, you know, the best person in a room or you shouldn't be. So surround yourself with people that can make you better uh, and that you aspire to be like. So that would be my dad advice for today. Love it, man. Love it. Thanks for coming on, Thanks, man. Brother. Guys, you know if you've made it this far that we're going to finally rep Survival Dispatch. Survival Dispatch is like a repository of survival information. Get in there. Survival information is vital to have. So get in there. Big thank you to them. And of course, my Patreon people. Love you guys. Stay safe. Stay cool. Talk to you next time.